Established in Weimar in 1919, the Bauhaus was a design school where the objective was to rethink all aspects of the environment, painting, architecture, sculpture, furniture, decorative objects, even photography, the theater, and the dance, and unite them in a single vision which would be appropriate to the needs of the new society. Unlike the Russians, whose utopian dreams for a new society were never fulfilled, many of the Bauhaus projects were, in fact, put into practical expression. And these are the things which have provided the guidelines for much of the great design in the 20th century. Modern architecture is also synonymous with the Bauhaus. This house was designed by Walter Gropius, the first Bauhaus director. Bauhaus architects were synthesizing constructivist ideas of functional materials with modern methods of prefabrication. On this experimental housing estate near Dessau in Germany, built in 1926, they could erect a house in three days, thus realizing the dream of many families who wanted clean, light, and economical housing. One might say that the Bauhaus marks the beginning of the modern era in architecture. But if we are looking for that which expresses the highest ideals of the modern movement, it must be the Villa Savoie, completed by Le Corbusier in 1930. This villa shows Le Corbusier's ideal in microcosmic form of a city raised on stilts. At first sight, even the most ardent modernist might be caught unprepared by its abstract conception. But one should not be deceived by the simplicity of its geometric exterior. As one approaches the villa's main entrance, a complex interior begins to reveal itself. The owners of the villa would ascend to their living area along a grand ramp that rises up through the house. Le Corbusier defined architecture as the magnificent, knowledgeable, and correct play of volumes in light. He saw architecture in highly idealized formulations. The Villa Savoie is at once a superb illustration of his ideal of formal harmony and a precise application of design principles derived from an analysis of reinforced concrete construction. The body of the Villa Savoie is lifted off the ground by columns. The internal spaces are opened up into each other since the walls no longer support any load. Windows are extended freely in strips across the facade and on the flat roof is a garden. Another architect, idealist, but of a very different kind, was at work in America, Frank Lloyd Wright. Wright's contributions to 20th century architecture emerged well before World War I with his so-called prairie style, seen here in the Roby House of 1908 to 9, with its horizontal thrust sheltering overhangs, terraces, and enclosed gardens. Although always identified with a peculiarly American vernacular, Wright's inspiration was eclectic, including Viennese, Japanese, and Mayan sources. His work would be published in Europe as early as 1910 and would have an influence internationally, including on the architects of the Bauhaus. Wright's concern for a marriage between architecture and landscape would lead to his 1936 house outside of Pittsburgh, Falling Water, built on a natural rock over a small waterfall. But at the same time, in the difficult years of the 1930s, he became more socially conscious and focused on the needs of urban life. He remained nonetheless attached to the elements of nature seen in the organic forms and use of natural light in such buildings as the Johnson Wax Building of 1936. 
But these developments in modernist art and architecture did not go uncriticized. Even at the time, many people felt that such work was elitist, that it didn't speak the language of ordinary people. Why, for example, was it necessary to strip a building of all its decoration or reduce a picture to a few lines? And so, ironically, at its most progressive point, modernism was still widely unacceptable, and many architects did not follow its lead. You can see this in some of the buildings made at that period in New York, like the Chrysler Building of 1928, the Empire State from 1930, and the Rockefeller Center here from 1932. The problem was, what style would appropriately express the enthusiasm for progress, industry, and democracy in America? Ironically, the solution was in a more narrative, decorative style that became known as Art Deco. This building is both a monument to the power of capitalism and a clear statement that the figurative tradition is still very much alive. In the entrance hall, the Rockefellers commissioned a huge mural from the famous Mexican painter Diego Rivera. He called it Man at the Crossroads. For Rivera, there was a simple choice facing working man, whom he places as if at the controls of world history, a choice between capitalism and socialism. For Rivera, virtue lay on the side of socialism, since the ruling system in Mexico had already passed successfully through its own revolution. To place such a propaganda image in the headquarters of one of the leading capitalist dynasties of America was to invite disaster. The press expressed outrage at the inclusion of Lenin in the mural, and the Rockefellers ended things by dismissing Rivera and having his work destroyed in 1934. Only a replica survives. It may seem surprising that such an artist could have painted for the great American cities. But where his theme was the power of the machine and the marvels of technology, he overrode political opposition earlier in the 30s. His populist realism and a strong traditional sense of compositional order appealed directly to the widest of publics in the States as well as Mexico. Rivera's art corresponded to a notion of revolution and social realism. Elsewhere, in Europe, another revolution was taking place, led by a poet who saw himself so much as a revolutionary that he traveled to Mexico to visit Rivera and Trotsky, André Breton. The surrealist revolution also emerged as a reaction to the abstract aspects of modernism. For the surrealists, art opened a route to the marvelous, or the surreal. This is René Magritte's Le Double Secret, painted in 1927. The Surrealists understood, perhaps better than any group, that man is like an iceberg, of which only a small part is visible in the light of the conscious mind, the rest of which is submerged and moved and guided by the darker currents of the human subconscious. The problem was how to find ways into the subconscious how to release the spontaneous flow of imagery and writing that would be as unsettling as the chance encounter of an umbrella and a sewing machine on a dissecting table. André Breton advocated two routes into the marvelous, through dreams and automatism. Influenced by psychoanalytical theory, Breton decreed that subconscious images could only become available if the oppressive control of reason was evaded. The transcription of dreams attracted the so-called painter painters, such as René Magritte and Salvador Dali. Dali's painting, Soft Construction with Boiled Beans, a premonition of civil war, seems to embody his ambition to visualize images of complete irrationality with incredible precision. Through his highly naturalistic style, Dali gives a sense of reality to images that are unreal inspired by nightmares and visions. The second kind of surrealist artist, the painter-poet, is exemplified by the sculptor Alexander Calder and the painters Joan Miro and Max Ernst. Using poetic techniques of free association, they explored ways of reducing the conscious control of the rational mind. 
Miro's paintings from the 20s, like Siesta, seem to have no structure, just a loose, free flow of images which seem to come out of the blue. Max Ernst, using a technique of rubbing natural objects, such as wood, shells, and leaves, managed to bring forth unforeseen images, creating landscapes that are truly surreal. This painting of 1927 is called Forest. <laughs> 